Chapter Nine of Spiders by Cecil Warburton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wolf Spiders Of the groups of wandering spiders which spin no snare but trust to speed and agility for their food, the Lycosidae or wolf spiders supply the best subjects for study. To begin with, they are very numerous at certain times of the year some species absolutely swarming in woods during may and june among the leaves which fell in the previous autumn during the summer months they are still in evidence but as winter approaches they rapidly disappear the swift motion and predaceous habits have earned them the name of wolf spiders but though they sometimes occur in incredible numbers so that it seems impossible to avoid treading upon them they do not hunt in packs each one is entirely concerned with his own individual quarry they are moderate sized or large spiders commonly about half an inch long in this country though there are exotic species which attain an inch and a quarter and in build they are very unlike the garden spider being elongate and with the abdomen nothing like so globular their habits vary considerably one genus appropriately named pirata is semi-aquatic living at the margins of rivers and ponds and able to run on the surface of the water but most of the lycosidae prefer dry land the drier the better heaths sand hills bare and stony stretches of soil even deserts are fertile in examples of this group most of the smaller species love the sunlight and it is often noticeable on a bright day when the ground seems to be alive with wolf spiders that a chance cloud obscuring the sun will cause them to disappear as if by magic some of the small lycosids seem to be absolute wanderers having no home at all but spending the night under a stone or any casual shelter while others dig a more or less temporary hole in the ground into which they carry their captured prey and in which they take refuge on the appearance of an enemy the large wolf spiders have permanent burrows from which they do not wander far and in the mouths of which they spend most of their time on the lookout for passing insects let us first catch one of the small wolf spiders and examine it this is not a very simple operation with creatures which can run so swiftly but after a few attempts we induce a specimen to run up into a glass tube held in the line of its course we see it to be a long bodied spider thickly beset with hairs which entirely hide the integument of the abdomen its general hue will probably be a dark gray and its abdomen will be decorated by a more or less distinct pattern due not as in the garden spider to pigments in the skin but to the coloration of the hairs but look particularly at its eyes a pocket lens will suffice to reveal that two of them are much larger and much more business-like in appearance than anything apira had to show these are directed forwards being placed at the upper angles of the perpendicular front face so to speak of the animal below them just above the jaws are four small eyes in a transverse row and behind them at some distance on the upper surface of the cephalothorax are yet another pair of moderate size in some groups of spiders the eyes are not only small but have an indefinite dull ineffectual appearance here they are clear-cut glossy and convex sight apparently counts for something in the case of the lycosidae and this is what we should expect a sedentary spider is informed of the whereabouts of its prey by the sense of touch through the trembling of the web but a wolf spider spins no web 
and is dependent on the keenness of its vision there is a very prettily marked english lycosid which is very often found on sand hills in situations particularly convenient for observation its name is lycosa picta and it is incidentally interesting as affording a good example of protective coloration for the sand hill variety is light colored and very inconspicuous when stationary on the sand while an inland variety not uncommon in the dark soil of heaths is of a much darker hue carefully scrutinizing the firmer sand of the dunes on a sunny june day i detect a number of small holes the burrows of a colony of these spiders and approaching cautiously i establish myself at full length at a distance of a yard or so on the side away from the sun in such an attitude that i can observe closely for a considerable time without too much discomfort the minutes pass and nothing happens but i know that the cardinal virtue of the naturalist is patience and i wait presently the dark circle of one of the burrows is obliterated it is filled by the sand-colored head of the spider coming up to prospect other heads appear and soon one spider bolder than the rest emerges bodily and remains for a minute motionless on the vive. finding no cause for alarm it presently begins moving about stealthily and before long several members of the colony are busily exploring the neighborhood a cloud passes over the sun and all quickly disappear into their holes but this time without alarm for they come forth unhesitatingly when the sun shines again it is a fascinating sight to observe these little creatures pursuing their operations in absolute silence under my very eyes a few stealthy steps are taken the body being so moved that the battery of eyes is brought to bear upon different points of the compass a short quick run ensues followed by more cautious movements i am not fortunate enough to see the actual running down of a quarry but in time i note one of the colony bringing home an insect in its jaws so absorbed am i that i fairly jump when a horrified human voice close at hand observes he's in a fit i have excited the solicitude of a girl's school which has approached noiselessly over the sand on their afternoon promenade and stands gazing at me with as much fascination as i at the spiders i hasten to reassure them but the spell is broken and the seance is at an end not a spider is visible but i can still do one thing here is a good opportunity of finding out something about the burrows of these spiders in turf the investigation would be difficult but it is easy to operate in the tolerably firm sand where the colony has established itself i insert a straw into one of the burrows as a guide to the exploration and with a knife carefully begin to remove the sand immediately round it it is lined i find by a very delicate and slight coating of silk no more than sufficient to keep the sand particles of its walls from falling down into the tube i go down for an inch and a half or so and find that the tube ends blindly in a sort of silk lined pocket but no spider is there this is mysterious for i am pretty sure that my spiders are at home i go to work upon another burrow but this time in a different way digging it out bodily with its surrounding sand and placing it on a sheet of paper with which i am luckily provided for a detailed examination i can now approach it from the side and by carefully removing the sand lay bare the whole silken tube as before there is a straight perpendicular burrow ending blindly and uninhabited 
but at a point at about halfway down the tube i find a branch bending upward so that the whole tunnel is y shaped and at the blind end of this branch i find the spider this observation suggests that the tunnels of some of our english wolf spiders may be more complex than was imagined at present nothing is known of their nature in the case of other species a little later in the summer the appearance of a troop of wolf spiders has undergone a marked change almost every individual will be found burdened with a circular bag of eggs attached firmly to its spinnerets and carried about with it in all its wanderings the cocoon is worth examination it is a rather flattened sphere with an equatorial line round it giving the effect of two valves an upper and a lower the operation of making it has very seldom been observed because it takes place in a closed retreat constructed for the purpose mccook was fortunate enough to see something of it in the case of a captive lycosa which he kept in a glass jar partly filled with soil luckily the spider dug its tunnel for cocooning purposes up against the side of the jar so that its interior was visible it was about an inch deep and fairly wide and its aperture was closed with silk against the perpendicular wall of soil a circular silken cushion about three-quarters of an inch in diameter was spun and the eggs deposited in the center the edges of the cushion were then gathered up and pulled over the eggs and the bag thus formed was finished off with an external layer of spinning work on the two halves of the sphere the seam or equator being left thin for the exit of the young spiders the lycosa then attached the cocoon to its spinnerets and proceeded to bite away the silken sheet which sealed the burrow the whole operation lasted about four and a half hours thenceforward till the young are hatched the wolf spider never quits her egg bag which she carries about on all her expeditions attached by threads to the spinnerets garden spiders die soon after laying their eggs and never see their progeny but here we have a case of maternal solicitude persisting for many days and the peckhams seized upon it as a good subject for investigating the subject of the memory of spiders if the cocoon were removed from the spinnerets after how long an interval would it be recognized by the mother a pirata was selected for experiment it offered great resistance to the removal of the cocoon seizing it with its jaws and trying to escape with it when it had been taken away the mother displayed great uneasiness searching for it in all directions it was returned to her after an hour and a half when she received it eagerly and immediately attached it in the usual position from three others of the same species the cocoons were removed and restored after thirteen fourteen and a half and sixteen hours respectively all remembered them and took them back immediately but twenty-four hours seemed to be the extreme limit of their memory after that interval two of the mothers refused to have anything to do with their cocoons while the third only resumed hers slowly and without any enthusiasm after it had been placed before her seven times in succession some other species seemed to possess a rather longer memory but the experimenters found no lycosid constant in her affection for so long a period as forty-eight hours we have said that lycosid spiders see comparatively well yet if they are placed within an inch or two of their cocoons they may be quite a long time finding them this is very puzzling until it is considered that its habitual position is such that the spider never sees it she never has seen it since its construction 
and does not in the least recognize it by sight spiders of other groups where the female remains near but detached from the cocoon are not at the same disadvantage and if the cocoon is removed to a short distance the mother will go straight to it and bring it back the wolf spider only knows the feel of the cocoon she may pass close by it without recognition but as soon as she touches it the cocoon is immediately resumed if the interval of separation has not been too great but is it necessary to restore to the spider her own cocoon will not that of another spider serve as well certainly it will a wolf spider will eagerly adopt the cocoon of a spider even belonging to a different genus if not greatly unlike her own in size nay even a ball of pith of the same size will be attached with alacrity to the spinnerets though if offered a choice between a cocoon and a pith ball the spider after some hesitation selects the real article one spider even accepted a cocoon into which a leaden shot had been inserted making it many times its original weight she could hardly crawl with her new burden but stuck to it gallantly and when several efforts to secure it to her spinnerets had proved ineffectual she carried it about between her jaws and the third pair of legs again we find the intelligence of the spider distinctly limited but its powerful instincts are equal to all ordinary requirements nature does not as a rule play extravagant pranks such as interchanging cocoons or substituting for them pith balls and leaden pellets the famous tarantula is a wolf spider though in america unfortunately the name has been quite wrongly applied to the members of an entirely different group everyone has heard of its deadly repute and of the myth that its bite can only be cured by the wild tarantula dance or tarantella it is one of the large lycosids of southern europe these as we have said are much less nomadic than the smaller species but have a permanent home from which they do not wander far afield they prefer waste arid places and their burrows are simply cylindrical tubes with the upper portion lined by silk the mouth being often surmounted by a sort of rampart of particles of soil mingled with small pieces of wood collected in the neighborhood the spider lurks in the mouth of the tube where its glistening eyes can be distinctly seen if an insect ventures near it rushes out and secures it if alarmed it retreats instantly to the bottom of the burrow that most fascinating of all entomological writers j h fabre made some observations on a tarantula of southern france which well deserve attention colonies of the spider were numerous in his neighborhood and he set himself to procure some specimens old writers assert that if a straw be inserted into the burrow the spider will seize it and hold it so firmly that it may be drawn forth fabre found this method exciting but uncertain in its results another plan which had been advocated was to approach warily and cut off the retreat of a spider by plunging the blade of a knife into the soil below it and so cutting off its retreat but this required very rapid action and was moreover apt to be prevented by the presence of stones in the soil he devised a new scheme he provided himself with a number of bumblebees in narrow glass tubes about the width of the spider burrows repairing to a tarantula colony he would present the open end of the tube to the mouth of a burrow the liberated bee seeing a hole in the ground exactly suitable for its own purposes would enter it with very little hesitation there would be a loud buzz and then instant silence inserting a pair of forceps into the hole fabre would then withdraw the bee 
with the spider clinging tenaciously to it in all cases the death of the bee was instantaneous though the closest examination of its dead body revealed no wound now fabre was fresh from his wonderful studies of the habits of the solitary wasps which provide their young with insects stung in such a way as to cause paralysis but not death in their case the problem was to secure food for their larvae which should remain fresh for many days an instinct taught them to solve it in the most remarkable manner the problem of the spider was different it was a case of killing instantly or being killed a merely wounded bee is as formidable as one unharmed what fabre desired to know was this did the spider trust to one invariable deadly stroke in dealing with the bee as the solitary wasp according to its species had been found to act always precisely in the same way in paralyzing its victim to settle this point the spider must be seen at work and the obvious plan seemed to be to enclose a bee and a tarantula in a glass vessel and see what would happen but nothing happened at all the spider away from its burrow refused to attack the equally matched antagonists treated each other with the greatest respect and only evinced a desire to keep as far apart as possible even when placed in the same tube both acted on the defensive and no light was thrown on the problem but fabre's ingenuity was equal to the occasion it occurred to him that to use as bait an insect of burrowing habits had been a tactical error if instead of a bumblebee some other insect equally formidable but not attracted by holes in the ground were selected for the purpose the spider might be induced to rush forth and reveal its method of attack a large carpenter bee xylocopa was chosen and the mouth of the tube containing it was presented as before to the mouth of the tarantula tunnel the insect showed no disposition to enter the tunnel but buzzed in the tube outside many burrows were tested before any luck attended the investigator but at length a spider responded there was a fierce rush a clinch and the bee was dead the operation was too rapid to follow but the spider's fangs remained where they had struck embedded just behind the insect's neck the experiment was repeated until sufficient cases had been witnessed to establish the fact that the tarantula dealt no random stroke but with unerring precision and lightning rapidity plunged its fangs into the vital spot fabre quaintly exclaims in french i was delighted by this murderer's knowledge i was compensated for my epidermis being roasted in the sun examples of the same species of tarantula kept in captivity threw further light on the habits of the group these large lycosids live for years and are at first wanderers on the face of the earth they do not settle down and burrow till the autumn just after they have attained maturity these young adults are only about half the size they will eventually attain but the burrows are enlarged at need so that it is customary to find tubes of two sizes those of the newly established small females and those of the fully grown females of two or more years old curiously enough if disturbed they entirely decline to burrow unless it be the proper season for that operation but remain inert and helpless on the surface till they die if however a tunnel is provided for them they enter it at once and adapt it to their needs the legs take no part in the burrowing process which is entirely carried out by the jaws with infinite labor small particles of earth are dislodged and carried by the mandibles to be dropped at a considerable distance from the nest the parapet round the mouth of the tube is in nature usually quite a small erection 
but this seems to be due to the fact that only a small amount of suitable material is available in the immediate neighborhood and the spiders will not go far afield in captivity where abundance of material was supplied they attained a height of two inches small stones sticks and strands of wool cut into lengths of one inch and of various colors were placed within reach and all were used in building the parapet comparatively large pebbles were rolled up for a foundation and fragments of earth and pieces of wool entirely irrespective of color were bound together by irregular spinning work on sunny days the spiders would crouch behind the parapet with their eyes above its level to distant insects they paid no attention but if one approached within leaping distance it was pounced upon with unfailing accuracy in due season the captives laid their eggs and enclosed them in the regulation cocoon which they attached to their spinnerets never parting from them thenceforward though considerably hampered by them in their movements up and down the tube but a very remarkable change now took place in their behavior at the mouth of the tunnel in sunny weather instead of remaining as fabre puts it a coude on the parapet they reversed their position raised their egg cocoons with their hind legs and slowly and deliberately turned them about so that every part in succession should be exposed to the sun's rays we now come to a remarkable habit possessed by all the lycosidae when the young are ready to leave the cocoon they find an exit at the thinner equatorial seam and proceed immediately to climb on to the back of the mother clinging firmly to her covering of hairs if a wanderer she carries them thus on all her expeditions if a stay at home they accompany her up and down her tube they are often dislodged indeed when alarmed they scatter for the moment but when the peril has passed they immediately swarm up the maternal legs to their former position now in the case of the tarantula it is seven months before they are able to fend for themselves meanwhile they eat nothing and look on with indifference while their mother feeds she not only carries them willingly but exhibits solicitude when deprived of them but she shows no discrimination as to her own offspring and is quite content with those of another spider the young when brushed off climb the legs of the nearest female and a spider may thus be laden with thrice her proper load without any protest they form a layer two or three deep and can then only find room by covering the whole of her back they nevertheless take care not to obscure her vision by covering her eyes two mother tarantulas each with her young on her back came into contact and a battle a outrance took place one was slain but the double brood scattered by the conflict on its cessation climbed on to the back of the victor and remained calmly in position while she proceeded to dine in leisurely fashion on the vanquished in march seven months after hatching the young were ready to start life for themselves their first action was to climb to the highest points attainable whence they set sail in the manner already described and were borne gently away in the air we can hardly leave the tarantula without saying something on the vexed question of spider venom all over the world there are certain particular spiders whose bite is especially feared among them are the tarantula and the malmignant of southern europe the von coho of madagascar the katipo of new zealand and the kahooge of the west indies quite an extensive literature has arisen around the subject but its perusal leaves one not much wiser than one was before circumstantial accounts of death from the bite of a spider are countered by the assertions of experimenters 
that they have allowed themselves to be bitten repeatedly by the same species without suffering any inconvenience there is at all events some basis for the popular view in the fact that all spiders possess a poison gland which is analogous to that of the snake inasmuch as it opens near the tip of the fang which is plunged into the animal attacked in the case of the large powerful spiders of the family megalidae and perhaps in the tarantulas the effects of the bite on higher animals are not negligible and clearly exceed the results of a mere puncture a young sparrow and a mole bitten by fabre's tarantula in spots by no means vital died within a few hours but it is a very remarkable fact that many of the most dreaded spiders are neither large nor powerful the malmignate the von coho and the katipo and the kehuge are all members of the comparatively weak jawed therididae and their only striking characteristic is vivid coloration all being marked with red spots it is probable that their deadly powers are almost entirely fabulous and that they have been singled out as particularly dangerous merely because of their conspicuous appearance the smaller species are certainly harmless as far as man is concerned and it is even disputed whether their poison plays much part in the ordinary slaying of insects the very inconsistent results of experiments may be due to some control exercised by the spider over the output of poison there is no proof that its ejection is automatic and it is quite possible that the spider is economical in its use or again in some of the cases of innocuous biting the supply of venom may have run short end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Spiders by Cecil Warburton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Jumping Spiders. We are not in the land of the jumping spiders or Atidae, and our few and sober colored examples of the group give but a feeble idea of the added fauna of tropical countries where these creatures abound and often rival the ruby tail flies in the brilliancy of their hues it is one of the largest groups numbering several thousand species but the british list includes barely thirty and most of these are of rare occurrence or at all events exceedingly unlikely to be met with by any but the most energetic collector indeed it may be said that there is only one british species which we may look forward with tolerable confidence to finding upon some sunny wall or fence in the summer in whatever part of the country we may be this is saltica senecus sometimes called the zebra spider though absolutely dowdy in comparison with most of its tropical cousins it is a not unattractive little creature and illustrates sufficiently well the characteristics of its tribe armed with a pocket lens a glass tube or two and more necessary still the very largest amount of patience we can summon we go in quest of the zebra spider a tarred fence is a good hunting ground because the spider if present is readily seen but if this is drawn blank we must have recourse to a wall where sharper eyesight will be required our quarry is of small size not more than a quarter of an inch long in the body which resembles that of the wolf spiders in build the abdomen not rising above the level of the forebody or cephalothorax it is thickly clothed with short hairs black white and gray so arranged as to show oblique zebra-like stripes on either side of the abdomen the legs are short and robust 
very different from the long thin limbs of the garden spider especially strong are the forelegs the head is broad and square with a high perpendicular forehead but the most remarkable features are the eyes on the vertical front are four splendid eyes the wolf spider's eyes are large but these in comparison are immense especially the median pair their axes are directed straight in front four other eyes are placed on the top of the head far apart from each other the more forward pair very small the hind pair of moderate size in some added spiders these great anterior eyes are wonderful objects under the microscope deep sea green in hue and fringed with colored hairs they form a veritable battery which the spider brings to bear upon the object of its chase human eyes to match them in comparative size would literally have to be as large as saucers if we are in luck we soon descry a salticus showing up boldly against the black surface of the fence and to set ourselves to watch its antics attentively one thing strikes us at once it is quite at home on a perpendicular surface nay on the underside of a horizontal beam for that matter now a garden spider would have great difficulty in maintaining itself in such a position unless well supplied with silken lines to which to cling evidently there is some difference in the structure of the feet of these spiders which may be worth investigating later on also we notice some odd tricks of movement in the jumping spider a curious way of exploring the surface on which it is working by a succession of short runs alternately with periods of absolute stillness as though on the qui vive a noticeable freedom of movement between the fore and the hind bodies so that its battery of eyes may be directed to this side or that sometimes an elevation of forepart as though for the purpose of obtaining a wider view we may have to wait long before we see it successful in the chase it will often patiently explore a large area testing the surface with its palps as it goes without any obvious reward it conscientiously searches all depressions and crannies and sometimes remains in them for a considerable time perhaps to devour some minute creature which did not call into play its special methods of attack at last it sights a small insect which has alighted on the fence a few inches away we see it turn its head in that direction and remain motionless soon it begins to edge nearer in a stealthy manner striving to approach its prey from behind till with a sudden spring it pounces on its back not always is the spring successful often the insect sees its peril at the last moment and takes to wing but in this case how does the spider avoid a fall we see what we had not noticed before that it is anchored to the fence by a silken line indeed all the time it has been hunting it has been trailing behind it an exceedingly fine thread of silk which it has attached at frequent intervals to the fence so that it can check its fall at will in the case of accident at the right angle we may see the delicate filaments glistening in the sun over the surface of its explorations the garden spider entangles its prey in a web the wolf spider runs it down by sheer strength and speed but the jumping spider stalks it like a red indian the actions of the spider make it quite evident that its power of sight is well developed mr and mrs peckham whose remarkable observations on the mating habits of jumping spiders must presently be considered established friendly relations with some of their captives 
which became so tame as to jump on their hands and take food from their fingers they frequently induced them to jump from a finger of one hand to one of the other gradually increasing the distance up to eight inches they also twice observed a male chasing a female upon a table covered with jars books and boxes the female would leap rapidly from one object to another or would dart over the edge of a book or a box so as to be out of sight in this position she would remain quiet for a few moments and then creeping to the edge would peer over to see if the male were still pursuing her if he happened not to be hidden she would seem to see him even when ten or twelve inches away and would quickly draw back moreover that they have the ability to discriminate colors has been shown by their behavior when imprisoned in cages consisting of a series of communicating chambers each with a glass top of a different hue they show a marked preference for the red chamber under these circumstances while the least attractive color seems to be blue it has been known for a long time that the males of many kinds of birds especially of the more ornamental species are accustomed to perform the most extraordinary antics in the presence of the female at the time of mating the peckhams made the unexpected discovery that precisely similar love dances took place in the case of the jumping spiders even the comparatively sober colored zebra spider performs a weird pasul in courting its mate but its display is feeble compared with that of some of the more ornate of the atidae certain isolated observations on captive jumping spiders led these observers to suspect that the mating habits were unusual and worthy of accurate investigation and they laid their plans accordingly taking their summer holiday a month earlier than usual so as to miss nothing of the pairing season and including in their party an artist whose drawings should furnish an indubitable record of the attitudes assumed by the male spiders in their evolutions on arriving at their destination they found a small species satis pulex with no great claims to remarkable beauty mature and ready to pair a female was placed in one of the experimental boxes which had been provided in advance and a male was admitted on the following day he sighted her at a distance of twelve inches and showing signs of excitement advanced to within about four inches and then performed a most ludicrous dance something in the nature of a highland fling in a semicircle before her she in the meantime moving in such a manner as to keep him always in view his exact behavior was this he extended all the legs and the palp on the left side folding the first two legs and the palp of the right side under him and leaning over sideways so far as nearly to lose his balance and in this attitude he sidled along towards the lowered right side till he had described an arc of about two inches then the position was instantly reversed the right legs being extended and the left folded under and the arc retraced a male was seen to repeat this performance one hundred eleven times he then approached nearer and when almost within reach whirled madly around and around her she joining and whirling with him after which she accepted him as a mate the next species to engage attention was an isius it was noteworthy that although the neighborhood was well known to the experimenters they had never met with this spider before but for a few days it swarmed on the fences just as birds are known to assemble from all quarters 
for the so-called love dances after the mating season the spiders wandered off into the woods again and were seen no more the performance was much as before but the spiders assumed different attitudes the female lay flat on the ground with her front legs raised the male danced on the six hind legs with the front legs lowered and meeting at the tips the males of this species were exceedingly quarrelsome sparring frantically whenever they met but their battles were entirely bloodless indeed say the observers having watched hundreds of seemingly terrible battles between the males of this and other species the conclusion has been forced upon us that they are all sham affairs gotten up for the purpose of displaying before the females who commonly stand by interested spectators in the case of one species after two weeks of hard fighting between the males the peckhams were unable to discover one wounded warrior the females on the other hand were often really formidable Phidippus morsitans is an example the male has handsome front legs thickly fringed with white hairs and he displays these to the best advantage in his love antics two males supplied in succession to one female had offered her only the merest civilities when she leaped upon them and killed them in the case of most of the spiders whose love dances were investigated the chief ornamentation of the male consisted of fringes of white or colored hairs on the face the palps and the front legs and they kept these parts always before the females displaying their glories to the utmost advantage the male of habrocestum splendens however possesses an extremely brilliant abdomen and lest anything of its beauty should be lost upon the object of his admiration he varies the ordinary performance in a remarkable manner he often pauses in the dance and raising his abdomen strikes an attitude in which he remains motionless for half a minute moreover he frequently turns his back on the female a most unusual occurrence in the course of these antics the males of one species phileus militaris were observed to capture and keep guard over young females which they imprisoned in webs spun for the purpose until they had undergone their last molt and were mature chasing away all intruders in the interval the jumping spiders furnish a much stronger case for those who believe that ornamentation plays an important part in sexual selection than do either birds or butterflies with regard to the birds it has been objected first that there is little evidence that the females pay much attention to the antics of the males and secondly that practically all the male birds pair whatever their claims to preeminent beauty now in the case of the jumping spiders the females follow the performances of the males with the utmost attention and seeing that the males are present in large numbers when the females begin to appear the latter are certainly in the position to reject such mates as do not please them the mere relation of the results of this most interesting investigation conveys no hint of the unwearied patience and close observation necessary to those who would surprise the secrets of nature one is apt to infer that it is only needful to place some spiders in a box establish oneself in an armchair and ring on the performance so to speak the peckhams modestly remark the courtship of spiders is a very tedious affair we shall condense our descriptions as much as possible but it must be noted that we often worked four or five hours a day for a week in getting a fair idea of the habits of a single species. End of chapter 10 
Chapter Eleven of Spiders by Cecil Warburton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. There are faucet spiders. It is quite impossible in a work like the present to deal with the classification of spiders. About forty families have been established, some of them of vast extent. The Atidae, for example, including some four thousand species. The great French arachnologist M. E. Simon has occupied two thousand quarto pages in defining the families, subfamilies, and genera, without concerning himself with the species at all. It is, however, desirable that the attention of the reader should be called to the primary division of the group according to which all spiders are either Erinae verae, true spiders, or Erinae theraphosae, theraphosid spiders. Now, these two kinds of spiders may readily be distinguished by a single, easily observable characteristic, the nature of the mandibles, or chelicerae, but it is necessary to describe the spider's mandibles before the difference can be appreciated. Their nature is perhaps best explained by saying that each mandible is not unlike a penknife with a single small blade, rather more than half open when in use, closed when at rest. The handle of the penknife is certainly in most cases very short and thick, and the blade not really a blade at all, for it has no cutting edge, but is a fang or piercing instrument generally somewhat curved and with a sharp point the blade is moreover perforated by a tube which comes from the poison gland situated in the thickened handle or in the spider's head so that poison can be forced into the wound which it inflicts now take two pen knives with the blades half open and hold them so that they hang with the hinge downward and with the blades directed towards each other it is clear that the blades may be made to pierce an object situated between them by moving the handles laterally the object being attacked simultaneously on either side this is the arrangement in the true spiders whose jaws move sideways though they do not always hang perpendicularly but are more often somewhat slanted forwards to represent the jaws of the theraphosid spider the pen knives must be arranged differently place the handles horizontally and parallel to each other with the blades directed downwards and also parallel they will now work not sidewise but up and down and both fangs will pierce the victim from above in a word the two spiders have jaws which can be separated or brought together and which tend to meet in the object into which they are plunged while the jaws of theraphosid spiders work in parallel vertical planes and strike downwards all the spiders which have so far concerned us are Arinae verae, and we have incidentally had occasion to note some of the principal families of that division, Epiridae or Argiopidae, as some prefer to call them, Theridae, Agilinidae, Thomisidae, Lycosidae, and Atidae. Indeed, there is only one theraphosid spider that there is the least likelihood of our coming across in this country. Their true home is in hotter climes and though stragglers from their army are not rare in the warmer portions of temperate regions, they abound only in tropical countries. They include the trapdoor spiders common in the Mediterranean region and in many other widely distant parts of the world, and the great bird-eating spiders of the tropics, the spiders which are quite wrongly but universally alluded to in America, as tarantulas the single british example is well worth the study of any reader who is fortunate enough to come across it 
but he must first catch his hare for atypus affinis or piceus as it used to be called does not grow in every hedgerow nor is it easy to find it where it does occur most of the localities recorded are in the south of england it is a thick-set dark-colored spider about half an inch in length and with very thick powerful mandibles which as we have seen work vertically its nest is a loosely woven tubular structure which partly lines a more or less vertical hole in the ground and partly lies exposed on the surface but which does not present any obvious opening for entrance and exit the situation chosen is generally a sloping sandy bank covered with vegetation the burrow is about eight inches in depth and about three quarters of an inch in diameter near the bottom it narrows and then expands into a somewhat wider chamber where the spider lives and constructs its egg cocoon the portion of the tube above the ground is sometimes longer but more often shorter than the buried portion and it tapers to a closed end mr joshua brown who first found this spider near hastings in eighteen fifty six took home several of the tubes with the spiders inside he could find no opening and though the spiders moved up and down the tubes they did not emerge on tearing a tube open he found no remains of insects inside but in one case he came across a worm partly within and partly outside the lower part of the tube and apparently partially devoured by the spider the same species is not rare in france and monsieur simon's observations on it closely agreed with those of mr brown he believed that the spider chiefly depended for its food on earthworms which in the course of their burrowings came casually into its neighborhood since these observations however considerable light has been thrown on the habits of the spider by enoch who found colonies on hampstead heath and near woking his investigations extended over several years and wonderful patience was needed before the secrets of this curious animal were divulged it appears that the female when once established never leaves the nest at all the aerial portion of the web was always a puzzle but now we know thanks to enoch that it constitutes the whole hunting ground of the spider like promises and pie crust it is apparently made to be broken if it is accidentally brushed against by a passing insect the spider is instantly aware of the fact rushes to the spot and transfixes the intruder with its powerful mandibles it turns on its back to do this and strikes the insect from behind afterwards pulling its prey through the weft and into the tube by main force it drags it to the bottom of the tunnel makes sure of its death and immediately returns and repairs the rent insects were held against the tube and the spider if hungry accepted them at once if replete however it always gave a tug at the tube which retracted a portion of it into the burrow a curious action which enoch quite learnt to interpret as the i don't want any more movement the males made nests exactly like the females but shallower and they left them to search for their mates leaving the ends open on finding a female nest they serenaded by tapping with their palps and after some delay tore open the web and entered by and by the female came up and repaired the rent first pulling the edges together with her jaws and then uniting them with silk from her spinnerets in one case nothing more was seen of the male for nine months when his empty skin was observed at the end of the tube 
after nine months of connubial bliss his consort had devoured him in the autumn and spring eggs and newly hatched young were often found in the nests late in march a small hole one sixteenth inch in diameter was noticed at the end of some of the webs and presently the young began to emerge never to return to the nest they immediately climbed the highest objects at hand and some were seen to be carried off by the breeze enoch found by an ingenious experiment that the sand which is incorporated in the aerial part of the tube no doubt to render it inconspicuous is obtained from within and not from outside the nest carefully covering the exposed web he powdered the ground all around it with red brick dust but the particles which the spider embedded in the web were of brown sand evidently obtained from the bottom of the burrow and not from the surrounding surface but in the case of some newly dispersed young spiders he was able to see this operation performed the first part of the nest to be made was the aerial portion at the foot of which the digging was commenced particles of sand were brought up in the jaws of the young spider and pushed into the weft of the tube occasionally the jaws were thrust through the delicate web and particles from without were seized and pulled into the silken fabric it is sad to have to relate that such young spiders as did not emerge from the web within a reasonable time were devoured by their unnatural parent it sometimes happened that a change of weather rendered it unsuitable for the departure of the young and in this case the mother closed up the exit hole and retired to feed upon her offspring thus though there were as many as a hundred and forty in a brood a good many perished at the outset and the ants in the surrounding soil accounted for some of the rest the atipidae form a small outlying group of the theraphosid spiders and are able to live in colder regions than most of their relatives the great bulk of the division belong to the family of vincularidae some of the vincularidae are not unlike agelena in their mode of life spinning a dense sheet web terminating in a tube and entrapping their prey far the greater number however as far as their habits are known at all are earth dwellers either inhabiting more or less complex burrows of their own or sheltering under stones or in chance cavities by day and emerging at night to seek food in the immediate neighborhood of their hiding places some of them are quite small but the majority are large robust spiders of formidable appearance the largest known spider theraphosa liblondi is found in south america and its body measures more than three and a half inches in length few spiders have attracted more attention than the fabricators of the curious trap door nests which are common in the riviera and indeed in all the countries bordering the mediterranean but abundant though they are they are extremely difficult to find and it is generally only by chance that their existence is detected the tarantula occasionally closes the mouth of her tunnel with a sheet of silk in which are encrusted the debris of insects or particles of soil she does this at the time when she is spinning her cocoon and any intrusion is particularly inopportune but she does it also on other occasions which are not so easily accounted for a reason which would naturally occur to us would be the exclusion of excessive rain or excessive sunshine but the facts unfortunately do not accord with this explanation now however desirable occasional closure may be a permanent door would hamper the tarantula in her hunting operations but the habits of the trapdoor spider are different and she closes her retreat with a wonderful hinged lid or trapdoor 
and the commonest form of trap-door is also the most perfect, being thick and tapering, and fitted accurately into the beveled mouth of the tube like a stopper in the mouth of a bottle. It is made of alternate layers of spider silk and earth, and is free for more than half its circumference, the remaining portion of the surface disc being attached to the side of the tube by a flexible hinge of silk. Mogridge dissected the door of a full-size tunnel into fourteen graduated discs. The smallest, and of course the lowest, represented the first door ever made by the spider, and the successively larger discs indicated the stages at which its increasing size rendered an enlargement of the tube, and therefore of the door, necessary. The spider always interweaves vegetable matter from the neighborhood into each new disc, so that, as a rule, it is entirely indistinguishable from its surroundings when closed, and not only dead vegetable matter, for if the tube is situated amongst moss, moss grows upon the lid. From our previous experience, however, we shall not be surprised to find that blind instinct and not forethought is responsible for this action. Mogridge removed the lid of a tunnel and also cleared the ground immediately round it of all vegetation. Nevertheless, when the spider made a new door, it covered it with moss taken from the undisturbed vegetation beyond, so that the trap door was now conspicuous as a green oasis in a sandy desert and on another occasion a spider interwove fragments of scarlet fabric left purposely at hand into the lid of its tunnel. It is clear, therefore, that the decoration of the door is due to an instinct which impels the spider to utilize any material in the neighborhood without any regard to the effect produced. The tube is densely lined with silk, which affords its architect a secure foothold, and if any enemy attempts to open the lid from without, the spider resists with all its strength, which is not inconsiderable, clinging on to its under surface with its front legs and jaws, while the claws of its other feet grasp the silken walls of the tube. The other type of trap door is less interesting and much more elementary consisting simply of a wafer-like sheet of silk mixed with earth and vegetable matter. But it is a curious fact that while all known trapdoor nests of the cork type are simple tubes, the burrows with wafer doors are much more complex. In some cases there is a branch tube, like that constructed by Lycosa picta, leaving the main tunnel at a depth of some three inches, and reaching the surface perhaps two inches away from the trap door, so that the whole excavation is Y-shaped. This branch tube is permanently closed by a thin sheet of silk and earth, which, however, it would not be difficult to break through if it were urgent for the spider to escape while the enemy was exploring the main tunnel. But a more interesting case is the occurrence of another trap door some way down the tube. If the tube is unbranched, this forms merely a second line of defense if the outer door is forced. But in the case of a branched tube, the additional door hangs at the fork of the Y and is so shaped as to form a perfect valve so that the spider, by holding it against one, or the other side of the tunnel can connect the bottom limb of the Y with either fork at will, leaving to the intruder a beautifully smooth lined tube to explore with no hint of the possibility of escape in other directions. There are sometimes other complications in the ramification of the tube, but these need not detain us. Each species of spider adheres to its own particular type of architecture and may safely, in a given neighborhood, be identified by its nest. As with the Lycosidae, the burrowing is all done by the mandibles, 
but here the first joint the handle of the penknife is of more importance than the blade or fang indeed the burrowing species of the avicularidae may be distinguished from the rest by their mandibles which are provided in front with a rastellum or row of teeth for digging a trapdoor spider then does not go to work like a rabbit or a terrier scratching and kicking away the earth as it digs it laboriously dislodges particles of soil with its powerful mandibles and carries away the loosened fragments to deposit them at a distance the trapdoor spiders of the mediterranean region are nocturnal creatures and little is known of their habits erber relates that a species found in the island of tinos comes out at night fixes open the trap door with a few threads and spins a web near its nest to entrap passing insects clearing away any trace of it before dawn in the case of some chinese and also some australian species observers allege that they frequently wander from their nests in the daytime a californian species was able to leave its nest when the trap door was weighted with three ounces of lead on re-entering it seized the edge of the door with its mandibles and raising it slightly inserted its front legs it then turned round and slipped backwards into the tube it always resisted the forcible opening of its door to the last moment when it let go and slid into the tube as though going down a well the larger avincularidae have acquired a reputation for feeding on birds and this has given rise both to their scientific and their popular name bird-eating spiders several travelers have stated that they have observed them with birds in their grasp and there is no doubt of their ability to kill any small bird or mammal though it is probable that they seldom have the opportunity for they spin no snare in which birds may be caught even without the aid of their poison their jaws are so large and powerful that they may easily attain the vital organs of small animals probably their staple food consists of the larger insects they live in holes in the ground or in trees or sometimes in the fork of a tree branch in such hiding places they spend the hours of daylight emerging at night in search of food their large size and uncanny appearance have attracted the attention of the collector and a great many species are known but the fact that they chiefly inhabit tropical countries has militated against any very extended study of their habits and the few items of information we possess are best related with regard to the particular spider observed and not taken as necessarily characteristic of the whole tribe there is little doubt that they live for several years mccook kept a specimen of dugicella hensi in captivity for five and a half years and he considered that when it reached him it was at least a year and a half old and probably more the same species has recently been made the subject of some very interesting observations by petrunkovich who obtained numerous living specimens from texas and kept them in captivity unless carefully packed they bore the railway journey badly and it was above all things necessary to supply them with water the captives were fed on grasshoppers crickets cockroaches and wolf spiders but they ate sparingly one grasshopper sufficing for three days in the summer while in the winter hardly any food at all was taken the sense of touch is extremely well developed in these spiders but in sight hearing and smell they are strangely deficient no response whatever was obtained to either high or low notes a cricket sang for hours quite close to a spider which had been kept hungry for several days without attracting any attention it is very remarkable by the way that insects show no instinctive dread of these formidable creatures not attempting to keep at a distance 
and indeed frequently running over them in trying to find a way out of the cage nor do the spiders seem to be at all guided by smell they evince no knowledge of the presence of insects which emit a strong odor nor do they react to such tests as those to which the garden spider was subjected unless strong irritants such as chlorine are employed in the perception of which it is perhaps unnecessary that smell in the strict sense should take any part they have eight eyes two of them round and rather business-like in appearance and the others oval or pear-shaped and they are very sensitive to light retreating at once from the direct rays of the sun or from a light flashed on them but they do not appear to see anything at all recognizing neither friends nor enemies by sight however close at hand it was far otherwise with a wolf spider in the same cage running towards the dugicella it was clearly aware of it at a distance of several inches and could not be persuaded to approach nearer but the supremacy of the sense of touch is most striking when the spiders are courting when the male is seeking the female he seems quite unaware of her proximity unless he accidentally brushes up against her if he loses contact for a moment he is quite at sea and wanders blindly about turning perhaps to the left when the least motion to the right would bring them together again this frequently happens when he has accidentally touched the female with one of the hind legs he immediately turns about and if she is still there all is well but if she has chanced to move out of reach he is quite at a loss neither sight nor sound nor smell guide him but touch only the delicacy of this sense however is quite remarkable he seems to be aware at once of the nature of the object which touches him assuming a threatening attitude if the touch is hostile or pouncing instantly if hungry and the touch is that of a passing insect if however the insect is lucky enough to escape it is in no danger of pursuit as in the case of many spiders though by no means of all his courting is not unattended with peril the tragic fate which sometimes overtakes the male spider has so hit the popular imagination that there is a general impression that the female spider is a confirmed misanthrope and desires the life of any suitor bold enough to approach her not at all we have simply to remember that spiders are carnivorous and prone to cannibalism if the female happens to be hungry she makes no nice discrimination between an amorous male and a succulent grasshopper if replete she may find time for the play of softer emotions the male of d hensey appears to be more or less prepared for a hostile reception on the part of the female for the thighs of his front legs are furnished with spurs at their extremity and with these he holds back and renders powerless her threatening fangs there is no doubt that the spider's delicate sense of touch resides in the hairs with which both body and limbs are thickly clothed they are of various kinds fine hairs bristles and stout spines and many of them are supplied with nerve fibers at the base the finer hairs are probably not sensory and they are in the case of some avincularid spiders very easily shed and have a strong irritant action on the hand that touches them not unlike the sting of a nettle it is not at all unusual for one large avincularid spider salmopius cambridgei to be brought over to england in cases of bananas from the west indies mr james adams of dunfurling has kept two specimens alive for a considerable time the first specimen lived in captivity for two years and nine months during which it molted five times but grew very little in size arriving in september it was at first fed on flies 
and in a few weeks when these began to fail it accepted beetles consuming about three a day in november even these insects were difficult to obtain and recourse was had to cockroaches at first about three cockroaches a week were eaten but the number decreased until in the middle of march it ceased feeding altogether and on april thirteenth it cast its skin it molted again in october and twice a year for the rest of its life in spring and autumn during six months it took no food at all and very little for four months previously at the last molt but one it lost a limb which however reappeared when the spider again changed its skin though it never attained the proper size with spiders as with insects molting is a very serious matter involving much more than the mere casting off of an external coat if all does not go well limbs may easily be lost in the operation nor is it rare to meet with instances in which the animal has perished in its unsuccessful attempt to discard the old integument mr adams's second specimen was kept alive for three years and ten months it molted only once each year in june or july and it died in the act of casting its skin in the case of these spiders also it was noted that insects supplied to them as food displayed no fear whatever there were always a few cockroaches in the same box and they were often observed actually with the spider in its nest but no notice was taken of them unless their host chanced to be hungry a photograph of this spider is given in the frontispiece it is an interesting fact that many of the avincularidae of southern asia and australia possess a sound producing apparatus which is entirely lacking in african and american forms but this is a subject which deserves a chapter to itself end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of spiders by cecil warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain stridulation many of the arthropoda the large group which includes insects and crustaceans as well as arachnida are able to produce sounds a fact familiar enough in such insects as crickets and grasshoppers as however the breathing apparatus of these animals is entirely different from that of mammals and has no connection whatever with the mouth and alimentary canal the mode of sound production is not at all the same instead of setting vocal cords in vibration by the expulsion of air through the larynx insects sing or chirp by rapidly rubbing together certain specially roughened surfaces which constitute what is called a stridulating organ in crickets for instance each tegmen or wing cover is provided with a kind of file and when the wing covers are rapidly vibrated the edge of each rubs against the opposite file and a shrill sound is produced the stridulating apparatus is by no means always in the same place the thorax may rub against the abdomen the leg against the wing cover or one of the mouth appendages against another nor are the sounds produced always audible to human ears at all events there are many creatures with what appear to be very well developed stridulating organs whose note has never yet been heard by any naturalist but there are doubtless numberless sounds beyond the range of our hearing which is limited like the keyboard of a piano now such a stridulating apparatus has been detected in many spiders and always in one of three situations either between the two parts of the body cephalothorax and abdomen or between the palps and the mandibles or between the palps and the front legs 
in some of the therididae the hind end of the cephalothorax is roughened and fits into a sort of socket in the abdomen which is provided with parallel ridges so that when the abdomen is vibrated the two surfaces are rubbed together but no one has yet heard a sound produced by these spiders the stridulating avicularidae however are easily heard the sound in some cases being described as a kind of whistle in others it has been said to have the effect of shot dropping upon a plate there are two quite distinct purposes for which sounds may be produced they may either serve as a call from one sex to the other or as a warning to intruders obviously the first purpose requires a sense of hearing in the sex appealed to and it is interesting to note that in the therididae which are among the spiders which show some appreciation of sound the organ is well developed in the male only being rudimentary or altogether absent in the female while in the avicularidae which appear to be quite deaf both sexes possess it equally in them its function is probably to warn off its enemies a purpose for which it is not at all necessary that the spider itself should hear it sometimes sounds have been quite wrongly attributed to spiders there is for example an australian species widely known among natives as the barking or booming spider for no better reason than that the spider has been found in the daytime at a spot where the booming was heard at night this case was investigated by professor baldwin spencer who found that quails were really responsible for the sounds with which the spider was credited the creature could however achieve a kind of whistle by rubbing its palps against its mandibles its stridulating apparatus was of the type common among the avicularidae its principle is that of the musical box where nail-like projections on a barrel strike against the teeth of a metal comb except that the barrel is stationary and the comb is moved up and down against it the barrel is here represented by the first joint of the mandible which is beset on its outer side with spines the inner edge of the first joint of the palp is furnished with keys which are rubbed against the mandible spines when the palps are vibrated these keys are very curious structures they are of various lengths and their shape will perhaps be understood when it is said that a tolerable model of one would be obtained by taking a flat iron bar sharpening it at the end and then so twisting it in the middle that the flat surface of one half is at right angles to the flat surface of the other half its appearance therefore varies according to the point of view the narrow edge of one half and the broad edge of the other being visible at the same time a moment's consideration will show that this torsion is calculated to give great rigidity to the keys for when the outer half is struck on the flat surface the inner half opposes its greatest diameter to the shock a similar structure is found in all the theraphosid spiders which are able to produce a sound though sometimes the keys are on the mandibles and the spines on the palp in staten island there is a wolf spider lycosa kochi which is known as the purring or drumming spider because of a curious habit which the male has at mating time of rapidly drumming on the dead leaves in a wood with its palps it runs hither and thither over the ground as if in search of something pausing at short intervals to purr and the sound has frequently been heard and correctly attributed to the spider before the way in which it is produced was discovered 
in this case it is probable that the production of sound is not the object of the spider at all for we have no evidence that wolf spiders hear on the other hand rapid tapping with the palps is a very characteristic action with male spiders at mating time and it is easy to believe that contiguous dry leaves would conduct vibrations to a female at some distance away and inform her of the presence of the male just so as we have seen our english theraphosid announces his arrival by tapping on the exposed part of the nest of the female end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of spiders by cecil warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain the spinning apparatus and the feet seeing that the possession of spinnerets is a characteristic of all spiders and that a great deal of the interest attaching to their life history arises from their spinning operations any account of the group however brief would be incomplete without some attempt to describe these remarkable organs among the spiders to which the attention of the reader has been directed some have been highly accomplished spinners constructing complicated snares retreats and egg cocoons while in the case of others the spinning work is very meagre and employed chiefly for the protection of the eggs as might be expected the organs attain a very much higher development in some spiders than in others and the most complex of all are those of the apiridae the constructors of the circular snare now in the first place it is rather striking that the spiders with the most conspicuous spinnerets are by no means the most able spinners the bird-eating spiders are a case in point for they spin very little yet two of their spinnerets are much more obvious than anything epeira has to show for they protrude behind the body and strike the eye at the first glance indeed excessive length has nothing to do with the complexity but is found wherever a wide sweep is necessary in laying down the threads as we saw in the case of agelina when constructing its sheet web roughly speaking the spinnerets are very mobile finger-like projections generally situated under the hind end of the abdomen and bearing more or less numerous tubes from which the silken threads proceed the usual number of spinnerets is six but there is a pretty wide range one group of spiders having only two while a few possess eight the spinnerets then are only the bearers of the actual tubes which emit the silk the distribution of the tubes themselves is different in the different kinds of spiders but it is usually possible to distinguish two kinds there are generally present a large number of very fine cylindrical tubes or spools and a few conical tubes of much larger base which are called spigots each of these orifices whether on spool or spigot is connected by a fine tube with a separate silk gland or organ for manufacturing silk situated within the spider's abdomen epeira has about six hundred of such glands each with its own terminal spool or spigot and the large number of these tubes has given rise to a misconception that is very widely spread namely that the spider's line fine as it is is quotes, woven of hundreds of threads of very much finer silk this is not so as we shall presently see though epeira has some six hundred silk glands it has only five different kinds of gland 
manufacturing silk of different properties no other family of spiders has so many though two other kinds of gland have been found in less elaborate spinners within the spider the silk is fluid but it solidifies on meeting the air each thread hardening as it emerges though still continuous with the fluid contents of the gland so that the drawing out of a silken thread is just like the operation so familiar with the glue pot or with spun glass except that the hardening is not due to cooling but to exposure to the air this general description will it is hoped make an account of the organs in Epeira more comprehensible the spinnerets of Epeira are so small and inconspicuous that their disposition is not very easy to make out when not in use they form a tiny cone under the tip of the abdomen and only four are visible their free ends being so brought together as entirely to conceal a small central pair there are really then three pairs of spinnerets which we may call at once the anterior median and posterior pairs though when at rest only the anteriors and posteriors can be seen if the spider is observed with a pocket lens as it crawls about in a glass tube it will be noticed that the spinnerets are capable of great mobility their ends can be separated or brought together or they may be made to rub against each other or against the sides of the tube the anteriors and posteriors moreover are two jointed though the medians consist only of a single joint so much can be seen without any great magnification but the microscope will be necessary if a complete understanding of their mechanism is to be arrived at what it reveals will now be briefly described and will it is hoped be made tolerably clear by the accompanying figures which are simplified by the omission of a large number of bristles which tend to hide the essential structure and by a great reduction in the number of spools though the spigots are all indicated the anterior spinneret that nearest the head end of the animal is a sort of cone divided into a large basal joint and a small terminal joint the latter bears on its inner side a single spigot and is crowned with a battery of spools about a hundred in number the median spinneret has three spigots two at the tip and one on the inner side and about a hundred spools mostly on its inner surface the posterior spinneret is divided very obliquely into two joints so that the terminal joint extends much lower down on the inner than on the outer side it has five spigots in groups of three and two and again there are about a hundred spools now the point that i wish to make clear is that there is no interweaving of the output of these various spools and spigots at the moment of emission the threads are adhesive and can be made to stick to the glass or to one another but they are not in any sense either fused or interwoven for ordinary operations the brunt of the work is borne by the anterior spigots marked a in the figure sometimes reinforced by silk from the spigots on the median spinnerets marked b the functions of all the other spools and spigots being special and occasional for instance when epeira is laying down a foundation line this is what happens the spider sits down so to speak on a twig separating its spinnerets and rubbing them on the surface as it raises its abdomen a multitude of little threads are seen merging into what appears to be a single line in reality the line is double 
emerging from the spigots on the anterior spinnerets and it can easily be separated into two and two only anywhere along its length the multitudinous spools have emitted short lengths of silk to anchor the foundation line at its commencement but they are then closed and have no share in the ever lengthening line as the spider lets itself drop or crawls away to attach it to a new spot one of their uses then is to anchor the main lines from the spigots to external objects but they have another function and not less important everybody has seen a garden spider trussing up a captured fly it is held in the jaws and front legs and slowly revolved while with its hind legs the spider draws out bands of silk from the spinnerets and swathes it like a mummy no silken rope this of fused or interwoven threads but a broad band every strand of which is separate and distinct and proceeds from a different spool two or three hundred fine threads wound simultaneously round the insect form a much more effectual winding sheet than would a single cord composed of them all so far we have accounted for the spools and for one pair of spigots those on the anterior spinnerets the lower spigot on the middle spinneret often assists in laying down a foundation line when extra strength is required in that case the line is fourfold and can easily be split into four along its whole length the threads from the middle spinnerets being rather finer than those from the anterior but composed of the same kind of silk there remain seven pairs of spigots whose function has still to be explained two on the middle and five on the posterior spinnerets the three which are clustered together on the posterior spinneret do not form silk at all that is the material they emit does not harden on exposure to the air but remains fluid and adhesive when the spider is spinning the viscid spiral of its web it is from these spigots that the sticky matter oozes enveloping the true silken lines and presently resolving itself into little globules in the manner already described the remaining spigots two on the middle and two on the posterior spinnerets are employed only in spinning the egg cocoon and the silk they produce is unlike that used in making the snare being much stronger and less elastic and in the case of the garden spider of a yellow color in the occasional attempts which have been made to substitute spiders for silkworms as commercial silk producers it is only this cocoon silk that has given any considerable results the produce of the other glands being far too frail for profitable use such attempts however have always failed principally for a reason quite unconnected with the particular nature of the silk namely the difficulty of keeping the spiders in captivity it is a simple matter to supply dozens of silkworms in the same box with mulberry leaves but spiders require separate compartments or they will fight and devour each other and the provision of suitable food for them is such a troublesome matter that it has proved quite impracticable on a commercial scale we have incidentally seen that there are quite a number of different operations in which the spinning apparatus takes part there is the line which most spiders lay down as they wander and which secures them from the danger of a fall if they lose their footing there is the snare for catching prey the nest or retreat and the egg cocoon and in addition silk from the spinnerets may be used to enwrap and paralyze captured insects or to assist the young spider to migrate 
since the epiridae perform all these operations and are moreover the most finished of snare makers it does not surprise us to find in them the highest development of the silk glands and the most complete battery of spools and spigots on the spinnerets many spiders as we know make no snare at all and in the case of some very little spinning is attempted beyond the manufacture of a rather rudimentary covering for the eggs naturally a less complex spinning apparatus is required and we accordingly find that jumping spiders for instance have only about fifty silk glands comprising three different kinds of gland while the glands found in such of the large aviculariidae as have been examined have been all alike there is in some spiders a spinning organ not to be found in apira which deserves a passing notice it does not take the place of spinnerets of which the usual three pair are present but it is situated in front of them and only occurs in the female of the species its peculiarity is that the silk does not emerge from projecting spools but through fine holes in a sieve like plate called a cribellum which is flush with the surface of the abdomen it has no mobility therefore and the threads from it have to be combed out and distributed by the spider's hind leg for the better accomplishment of this purpose there is a special comb of stiff hairs or bristles called a calamistrum on each of the fourth pair of legs the web of these spiders is not unlike that of agelina but of a rather finer texture and it can be seen on magnification to consist of an irregular groundwork over which have been spread wavy bands of excessively fine silk combed out from the orifices of the cribellum glands some of these cribellate spiders of the genus amarobius are not uncommon in our cellars and outhouses their bodies are of stouter build and their legs much shorter than those of the common house spider we have no place for anything approaching a full description of the anatomy of spiders but there is one other point of structure of which the reader has been promised some account attention was directed to the fact that while some spiders are helpless on smooth perpendicular surfaces unless they have lines to cling to others can run with ease upon the walls or even the ceiling of a room the last joint or tarsus of the spider's leg is very different in the two cases it always terminates in claws either two or three so that any species can make some show of climbing where the surface is rough and there is anything to cling to but to obtain a hold on a polished surface it needs a special contrivance this takes the form of a pad of curiously modified hairs called a scopula the hairs are club-shaped narrow at their stalk and swelling towards the tip and their clinging power seems to be due to a viscid secretion the foot of any jumping spider will show this structure well epira has no scopula and its climbing is always laborious unless it has a thread to cling to but it is supreme as a rope walker treading daintily on the most delicate threads mounting a line hand over hand with great agility and manipulating the silk in its various spinning operations with unerring skill and facility End of chapter 13